Today, in audiobooks for me, we are going to listen to The Secret of Chimneys by Agatha Christie. This book is divided in four videos. This is part two. We hope you enjoy it. Chapter eight, A Dead Man. On that same Thursday afternoon, Virginia Revel had been playing tennis at Ranelagh, all the way back to Pont Street, as she lay back in the long, luxurious limousine. A little smile played upon her lips as she rehearsed her part in the forthcoming interview. Of course, it was within the bounds of possibility that the blackmailer might not reappear, but she felt pretty certain that he would. She had shown herself an easy prey. Well, perhaps this time there would be a little surprise for him. When the car drew up at the house, she turned to speak to the chauffeur before going up the steps. How's your wife, Walton? I forgot to ask. Better, I think, ma'am. The doctor said he'd look in and see her about half past six. Will you be wanting the car again? Virginia reflected for a minute. I shall be away for the weekend. I'm going by the 6.40 from Paddington, but I shan't need you again. A taxi will do for that. I'd rather you saw the doctor. If he thinks it would do your wife good to go away for the weekend, take her somewhere, Walton. I'll stand the expense. Cutting short the man's thanks with an impatient nod of the head, Virginia ran up the steps, delved into her bag in search of her latchkey, remembered she hadn't got it with her, and hastily rang the bell. It was not answered at once, but as she waited there, a young man came up the steps. He was shabbily dressed and carried in his hand a sheaf of leaflets. He held one out to Virginia with the legend on it, plainly visible. Why did I serve my country? In his left hand, he held a collecting box. I can't buy two of those awful poems in one day, said Virginia pleadingly. I bought one this morning. I did, indeed, honour bright. The young man threw back his head and laughed. Virginia laughed with him. Running her eyes carelessly over him, she thought him a more pleasing specimen than usual of London's unemployed. She liked his brown face and the lean hardness of him. She went so far as to wish she had a job for him. But at that moment, the door opened, and immediately Virginia forgot all about the problem of the unemployed. For to her astonishment, the door was opened by her own maid, Elise. Where's Chilvers? she demanded sharply, as she stepped into the hall. But he is gone, madame, with the others. What others? Gone where? But to Datchet. Madam, to the cottage, as your telegram said. My telegram, said Virginia, utterly at sea. Did not Madame send a telegram? Surely there can be no mistake. It came but an hour ago. I never sent any telegram. What did it say? I believe it is still on the table, la bar. Elise retired, pounced upon it, and brought it to her mistress in triumph. Voila, madam. The telegram was addressed to Chilvers and ran as follows. Please take household down to cottage at once and make preparations for weekend party there. Catch 5.49 train. There was nothing unusual about it. It was just the sort of message she herself had frequently sent before when she had arranged a party at her riverside bungalow on the spur of the moment. She always took the whole household down leaving an old woman as caretaker. Chilvers would not have seen anything wrong with the message, and like a good servant had carried out his orders faithfully enough. Me, I remained, explained Elise, knowing that Madame would wish me to pack for her. It's a silly hoax, cried Virginia, flinging down the telegram angrily. You know perfectly well, Elise, that I am going to chimneys. I told you so this morning. I thought Madame had changed her mind. Sometimes that does happen, does it not, Madame? Virginia admitted the truth of the accusation with a half-smile. She was busy trying to find a reason for this extraordinary practical joke. Elise cut forward a suggestion. Mon Dieu, she cried, clasping her hands. If it should be the malefactors, the thieves, they send the bogus telegram and get the domestiques all out of the house, and then they rob it. I suppose that might be it, said Virginia doubtfully. Yes, yes, madame, 
that is it without a doubt. Every day you read in the papers of such things. Madame will ring up the police at once, at once, before they arrive and cut our throats. Don't get so excited, Elise. They won't come and cut our throats at six o'clock in the afternoon. Madam, I implore you, let me run out and fetch a policeman now at once. What on earth for? Don't be silly, Elise. Go up and pack my things for chimneys if you haven't already done it. The new Kailua evening dress and the white crepe mara cane and, yes, the black velvet. Black velvet is so political, is it not? Madam looks ravishing in the eau de Nile satin, suggested Elise, her professional instincts reasserting themselves. No, I won't take that. Hurry up, Elise. There's a good girl. We've got very little time. I'll send a wire to Chilvers at Datchet, and I'll speak to the policeman on the beat as we go out and tell him to keep an eye on the place. Don't start rolling your eyes again, Elise. If you get so frightened before anything has happened, what would you do if a man jumped out from some dark corner and stuck a knife into you? Elise gave vent to a shrill squeak and beat a speedy retreat up the stairs, darting nervous glances over each shoulder as she went. Virginia made a face at her retreating back and crossed the hall to the little study where the telephone was. Elise's suggestion of ringing up the police station seemed to her a good one, and she intended to act upon it without any further delay. She opened the study door and crossed to the telephone. Then, with her hand on the receiver, she stopped. A man was sitting in the big armchair, sitting in a curious, huddled position. In the stress of the moment, she had forgotten all about her expected visitor. Apparently, he had fallen asleep whilst waiting for her. She came right up to the chair, a slightly mischievous smile upon her face, and then suddenly the smile faded. The man was not asleep. He was dead. She knew it at once, knew it instinctively even before her eyes had seen and noted the small shining pistol lying on the floor, the little singed hole just above the heart, with the dark stain round it, and the horrible dropped jaw. She stood quite still, her hands pressed to her sides. In the silence, she heard Elise running down the stairs. Madame, madame? Well, what is it? She moved quickly to the door. Her whole instinct was to conceal what had happened, for the moment anyway, from Elise. Elise would promptly go into hysterics. She knew that well enough, and she felt a great need for calm and quiet in which to think things out. Madam, would it not be better if I should draw the chain across the door? These malefactors, at any minute they may arrive. Yes, if you like, anything you like. She heard the rattle of the chain, and then Elise running upstairs again, and drew a long breath of relief. Ah, she looked at the man in the chair and then at the telephone. Her course was quite clear. She must ring up the police at once. But still she did not do so. She stood quite still, paralysed with horror and with a host of conflicting ideas rushing through her brain. The bogus telegram. Had it something to do with this? Supposing Elise had not stayed behind, she would have let herself in. That is, presuming she had had her latchkey with her as usual to find herself alone in the house with a murdered man, a man whom she had permitted to blackmail her on a former occasion. Of course she had an explanation of that, but thinking of that explanation, she was not quite easy in her mind. She remembered how frankly incredible George had found it. Would other people think the same? Those letters now, of course she hadn't written them, but would it be so easy to prove that? She put her hands on her forehead squeezing them tight together. I must think, said Virginia. I simply must think. Who had let the man in? Surely not Elise. If she had done so, she would have been sure to have mentioned the fact at once. The whole thing seemed more and more mysterious as she thought about it. There was really only one thing to be done. Ring up the police. She stretched out her hand to the telephone, and suddenly she thought of George. A man. That was what she wanted. An ordinary, level-headed, unemotional man who would see things in their proper proportion 
and point out to her the best course to take. Then she shook her head. Not George. The first thing George would think of would be his own position. He would hate being mixed up in this kind of business. George wouldn't do at all. Then her face softened. Bill, of course. Without more ado, she rang up Bill. She was informed that he had left half an hour ago for chimneys. Oh, damn, cried Virginia, jamming down the receiver. It was horrible to be shut up with a dead body and to have no one to speak to. And at that minute, the front doorbell rang. Virginia jumped. In a few minutes, it rang again. Elise, she knew was upstairs packing and wouldn't hear it. Virginia went out in the hall, drew back the chain, and undid all the bolts that Elise had fastened in her zeal. Then, with a long breath, she threw open the door. On the steps was the unemployed young man. Virginia plunged headlong with a relief born of overstrung nerves. Come in, she said. I think that perhaps I've got a job for you. She took him into the dining room, pulled toward a chair for him, sat down herself facing him, and stared at him very attentively. Excuse me, she said, but are you, I mean, Eton and Oxford, said the young man. That's what you wanted to ask me, wasn't it? Something of the kind, admitted Virginia. Come down in the world entirely through my own incapacity to stick to regular work. This isn't regular work you're offering me, I hope. A smile hovered for a moment on her lips. It's very irregular. Good, said the young man in a tone of satisfaction. Virginia noted his bronzed face and long, lean body with approval. You see, she explained, I'm in rather a hole, and most of my friends are, well, rather high up. They've all got something to lose. I've nothing whatever to lose. So go ahead. What's the trouble? There's a dead man in the next room, said Virginia. He's been murdered, and I don't know what to do about it. She blurted out the words as simply as a child might have done. The young man went up enormously in her estimation by the way he accepted her statement. He might have been used to hearing a similar announcement made every day of his life. Excellent, he said with a trace of enthusiasm. I've always wanted to do a bit of amateur detective work. Shall we go and view the body, or will you give me the facts first? I think I'd better give you the facts. She paused for a moment to consider how best to condense her story and then began, speaking quietly and concisely. This man came to the house for the first time yesterday and asked to see me. He had certain letters with him, love letters, signed with my name. But which weren't written by you, put in the young man quietly. Virginia looked at him in some astonishment. How did you know that? Oh, I deduced it but go on. He wanted to blackmail me, and I, well, I don't know if you'll understand, but I let him. She looked at him appealingly, and he nodded his head reassuringly. Of course I understand. You wanted to see what it felt like. How frightfully clever of you. That's just what I did feel. I am clever, said the young man modestly, but... Mind you, very few people would understand that point of view. Most people, you see, haven't got any imagination. I suppose that's so. I told this man to come back today at six o'clock. I arrived home from Ranala to find that a bogus telegram had got all the servants except my maid out of the house. Then I walked into the study and found the man shot. Who let him in? I don't know. I think if my maid had done so, she would have told me. Does she know what has happened? I have told her nothing. The young man nodded and rose to his feet. And now to view the body, he said briskly. But I'll tell you this. On the whole, it's always best to tell the truth. One lie involves you in such a lot of lies, and continuous lying is so monotonous. Then you advise me to ring up the police? Probably but we'll just have a look at the fellow first. Virginia led the way out the room. On the threshold, she paused, looking back at him. By the way, she said, you haven't told me your name yet. My name? My name's Anthony Cade. 
Chapter 9 Anthony Disposes of a Body Anthony followed Virginia out of the room, smiling a little to himself. Events had taken quite an unexpected turn, but as he bent over the figure in the chair, he grew grave again. He's still warm, he said sharply. He was killed less than half an hour ago. Just before I came in? Exactly. He stood upright, drawing his brows together in a frown. Then he asked a question of which Virginia did not at once see the drift. Your maid's not been in this room, of course. No. Does she know that you've been into it? Why, yes, I came to the door to speak to her. After you'd found the body? Yes. And you said nothing? Would it have been better if I had? I thought she would go into hysterics. She's French, you know, and easily upset. I wanted to think over the best thing to do. Anthony nodded, but did not speak. You think it a pity, I can see. Well, it was rather unfortunate, Mrs. Revel. If you and the maid had discovered the body together, immediately on your return, it would have simplified matters very much. The man would then definitely have been shot before your return to the house. Whilst now they might say he was shot after. I see. He watched her taking in the idea and was confirmed in his first impression of her formed when she had spoken to him on the steps outside. Besides beauty, she possessed courage and brains. Virginia was so engrossed in the puzzle presented to her that it did not occur to her to wonder at this strange man's ready use of her name. Why didn't Elise hear the shot, I wonder, she murmured. Anthony pointed to the open window as a loud backfire came from a passing car. There you are. London's not the place to notice a pistol shot. Virginia turned with a little shudder to the body in the chair. He looks like an Italian, she remarked curiously. He is an Italian, said Anthony. I should say that his regular profession was that of a waiter. He only did blackmailing in his spare time. His name might very possibly be Giuseppe. Good heavens, cried Virginia. Is this Sherlock Holmes? No said Anthony regretfully. I'm afraid it's just plain or garden cheating. I'll tell you all about it presently. Now you say this man showed you some letters and asked you for money. Did you give him any? Yes, I did. How much? Forty pounds. That's bad, said Anthony, but without manifesting any undue surprise. Now let's have a look at the telegram. Virginia picked it up from the table and gave it to him. She saw his face grow grave as he looked at it. What's the matter? He held it out, pointing silently to the place of origin. Barnes, he said, and you were at Ranelagh this afternoon. What's to prevent you having sent it off yourself? Virginia felt fascinated by his words. It was as though a net was closing tighter and tighter round her. He was forcing her to see all the things which she had felt dimly at the back of her mind. Anthony took out his handkerchief and wound it round his hand. Then he picked up the pistol. We criminals have to be so careful, he said apologetically. Fingerprints, you know. Suddenly she saw his whole figure stiffen. His voice, when he spoke, had altered. It was terse and curt. Mrs. Revel, he said, have you ever seen this pistol before? No, said Virginia wonderingly. Are you sure of that? Quite sure. Have you a pistol of your own? No. Have you ever had one? No, never. You are sure of that? Quite sure. He stared at her steadily for a minute, and Virginia stared back in complete surprise at his tone. Then, with a sigh, he relaxed. That's odd, he said. How do you account for this? He held out the pistol. It was a small, dainty article, almost a toy, though capable of doing deadly work. Engraved on it was the name Virginia. Oh, it's impossible, cried Virginia. Her astonishment was so genuine that Anthony could but believe in it. Sit down, he said quietly. There's more in this than there seemed to be. First go off. 
To begin with, what's our hypothesis? There are only two possible ones. There is, of course, the real Virginia of the letters. She may have somehow or other tracked him down, shot him, dropped the pistol, stolen the letters and taken herself off. That's quite possible, isn't it? I suppose so, said Virginia unwillingly. The other hypothesis is a good deal more interesting. Whoever wished to kill Giuseppe wished also to incriminate you. In fact, that may have been their main object. They could get him easily enough anywhere but they took extraordinary pains and trouble to get him here, and whoever they were, they knew all about you, your cottage at Datchet, your usual household arrangements, and the fact that you were at Ranelagh this afternoon. It seems an absurd question, but have you any enemies, Mrs Revel? Of course I haven't. Not that kind, anyway. The question is, said Anthony, what are we going to do now? There are two courses open to us. A. Ring up the police, tell the whole story, and trust to your unassailable position in the world and your hitherto blameless life. B. An attempt on my part to dispose successfully of the body. Naturally, my private inclinations urge me to B. I've always wanted to see if I couldn't conceal a crime with the necessary cunning, but have had a squeamish objection to shedding blood. On the whole, I expect A's the soundest. Then, there's a sort of bowdlerized A ring up the police, etc. But suppress the pistol and the blackmailing letters, that is, if they are on him still. Anthony ran rapidly through the dead man's pockets. He's been stripped clean, he announced. There's not a thing on him. There'll be dirty work at the crossroads over those letters yet. Hello, what's this? Hole in the lining. Something got caught there, torn roughly out, and a scrap of paper left behind. He drew out the scrap of paper as he spoke and brought it over to the light. Virginia joined him. Pity we haven't got the rest of it, he muttered. Chimneys 11.45 Thursday. Sounds like an appointment. Chimneys, cried Virginia. How extraordinary. Why extraordinary? Rather high-toned for such a low fellow. I'm going to chimneys this evening. At least I was. Anthony wheeled round on her. What's that? Say that again. I was going to chimneys this evening, repeated Virginia. Anthony stared at her. I begin to see. At least I may be wrong, but it's an idea. Suppose someone wanted badly to prevent your going to chimneys. My cousin George Lomax does, said Virginia with a smile. But I can't seriously suspect George of murder. Anthony did not smile. He was lost in thought. If you ring up the police, it's goodbye to any idea of getting to chimneys today, or even tomorrow, and I should like you to go to chimneys. I fancy it will disconcert our unknown friends. Mrs. Revel, will you put yourself in my hands? It's to be plan B, then. It's to be plan B. The first thing is to get that maid of yours out of the house. Can you manage that? Easily. Virginia went out in the hall and called up the stairs. Elise, Elise, madam? Anthony heard a rapid colloquy, and then the front door opened and shut. Virginia came back into the room. She's gone. I sent her for some special scent, told her the shopping question was open until eight. It won't be, of course. She's to follow after me by the next train without coming back here. Good, said Anthony approvingly we can now proceed to the disposal of the body. It's a time-worn method, but I'm afraid I shall have to ask you if there's such a thing in the house as a trunk. Of course there is. Come down to the basement and take your choice. There was a variety of trunks in the basement. Anthony selected a solid affair of suitable size. I'll attend to this part of it, he said tactfully. You go upstairs and get ready to start. Virginia obeyed. She slipped out of her tennis kit, put on a soft brown travelling dress and a delightful little orange hat, and came down to find Anthony waiting in the hall with a neatly strapped trunk beside him. I should like to tell you the story of my life, he remarked, but it's going to be rather a busy evening. Now this is what you've got to do. 
Call a taxi, have your luggage put on it, including the trunk. Drive to Paddington. There have the trunk put in the left luggage office. I shall be on the platform. As you pass me, drop the cloakroom ticket. I will pick it up and pretend to return it to you. But in reality, I shall keep it. Go on to chimneys and leave the rest to me. It's awfully good of you, said Virginia. It's really dreadful of me saddling a perfect stranger with a dead body like this. I like it, returned Anthony nonchalantly. If one of my friends, Jimmy McGrath, were here, he'd tell you that anything of this kind suits me down to the ground. Virginia was staring at him. What name did you say? Jimmy McGrath. Anthony returned her glance keenly. Yes. Why? Have you heard of him? Yes, and quite lately. She paused irresolutely and then went on. Mr. Cade, I must talk to you. Can't you come down to chimneys? You'll see me before very long, Mrs. Revel. I'll tell you that. Now, exit Conspirator A by back door slinkingly. Exit Conspirator B in blaze of glory by front door to taxi. The plan went through without a hitch. Anthony, having picked up a second taxi, was on the platform and duly retrieved the fallen ticket. He then departed in search of a somewhat battered second-hand Morris Cowley, which he had acquired earlier in the day, in case it should be necessary to his plans. Returning to Paddington in this, he handed the ticket to the porter, who got the trunk out of the cloakroom and wedged it securely at the back of the car. Anthony drove off. His objective now was out of London, through Notting Hill, Shepherd's Bush, down Goldhawk Road, through Brentford and Hounslow, till he came to the long stretch of road, midway between Hounslow and Staines. It was a well-frequented road, with motors passing continually. No footmarks or tyre marks were likely to show. Anthony stopped the car at a certain spot. Getting down, he first obscured the number plate with mud. Then, waiting until he heard no car coming in either direction, he opened the trunk, heaved out Giuseppe's body, and laid it neatly down by the side of the road, on the inside of a curve, so that the headlights of passing motors would not strike on it. Then he entered the car again and drove away. The whole business had occupied exactly one minute and a half. He made a detour to the right, returning to London by way of Burnham Beaches. There again he halted the car, and choosing a giant of the forest, he deliberately climbed the huge tree. It was something of a feat, even for Anthony. To one of the topmost branches, he affixed a small brown paper parcel, concealing it in a little niche close to the bowl. A very clever way of disposing of the pistol, said Anthony to himself with some approval. Everybody hunts about on the ground and drags ponds, but there are very few people in England who could climb that tree. Next, back to London and Paddington Station. Here he left the trunk. At the other cloakroom this time, the one on the arrival side. He thought longingly of such things as good rump steaks, juicy chops, and large masses of fried potatoes. But he shook his head ruefully, glancing at his wristwatch. He fed the Morris with a fresh supply of petrol, and then took the road once more. North this time. It was just after half past eleven that he brought the car to rest in the road adjoining the park of chimneys. Jumping out, he scaled the wall easily enough and set out towards the house. It took him longer than he thought, and presently he broke into a run. A great grey mass loomed up out of the darkness, the venerable pile of chimneys. In the distance, a stable clock chimed the three quarters. 11.45, the time mentioned on the scrap of paper. Anthony was on the terrace now, looking up at the house. Everything seemed dark and quiet. They go to bed early, these politicians, he murmured to himself. And suddenly a sound smote upon his ears, the sound of a shot. Anthony spun round quickly. The sound had come from within the house. He was sure of that. He waited a minute, but everything was still as death. Finally, he went up to one of the long French windows from where he judged the sound that had startled him had come. He tried the handle. It was locked. He tried some of the other windows. 
listening intently all the while, but the silence remained unbroken. In the end, he told himself that he must have imagined the sound, or perhaps mistaken a stray shot coming from a poacher in the woods. He turned and retraced his steps across the park, vaguely dissatisfied and uneasy. He looked back at the house, and whilst he looked, a light sprang up in one of the windows on the first floor. In another minute, it went out again, and the whole place was in darkness once more. Chapter 10 Chimneys Inspector Badgeworthy in his office. Time, 8.30 a.m. A tall, portly man, Inspector Bagworthy, with a heavy regulation tread, inclined to breathe hard in moments of professional strain. In attendance, Constable Johnson, very new to the force, with a downy, unfledged look about him, like a human chicken. The telephone on the table rang sharply, and the inspector took it up with his usual portentous gravity of action. Yes, police station market basing, Inspector Badgeworthy speaking. What? Slight alteration in the inspector's manner. As he is greater than Johnson, so others are greater than Inspector Bagworthy. Speaking, my lord, I beg your pardon, my lord. I didn't quite hear what you said. Long pause, during which the inspector listens, quite a variety of expressions passing over his usually impassive countenance. Finally, he lays down the receiver after a brief, at once, my lord. He turned to Johnson, seeming visibly swelled with importance. From his lordship. At chimneys. Murder. Murder, echoed Johnson, suitably impressed. Murder it is, said the inspector, with great satisfaction. Why, there's never been a murder here, not that I've ever heard of, except the time that Tom Pierce shot his sweetheart. And that, in a manner of speaking, wasn't murder at all, but drink, said the inspector, deprecatingly. He weren't hanged for it, agreed Johnson gloomily. But this is the real thing, is it, sir? It is, Johnson. One of his lordship's guests, a foreign gentleman, discovered shot, open window, and footprints outside. I'm sorry it were a foreigner, said Johnson, with some regret. It made the murder seem less real. Foreigners, Johnson felt, were liable to be shot. His lordship's in a rare taking, continued the inspector. We'll get hold of Dr. Cartwright and take him up with us right away. I hope to goodness no one will get messing with those footprints. Bagworthy was in a seventh heaven. A murder. At chimneys, Inspector Bagworthy in charge of the case. The police have a clue. Sensational arrest. Promotion and kudos for the aforementioned inspector. That is, said Inspector Badgeworthy to himself, if Scotland Yard doesn't come butting in. The thought damped him momentarily. It seemed so extremely likely to happen under the circumstances. They stopped at Dr. Cartwright's, and the doctor, who was a comparatively young man, displayed a keen interest. His attitude was almost exactly that of Johnson. Why, bless my soul, he exclaimed, we haven't had a murder here since the time of Tom Pierce. All three of them got into the doctor's little car and started off briskly for chimneys. As they passed the local inn, the Jolly Cricketers, the doctor noticed a man standing in the doorway. Stranger, he remarked. Rather a nice-looking fellow. Wonder how long he's been here and what he's doing staying at the Cricketers. I haven't seen him about at all. He must have arrived last night. He didn't come by train, said Johnson. Johnson's brother was the local railway porter, and Johnson was therefore always well up in arrivals and departures. Who was there for chimneys yesterday? asked the inspector. Lady Eileen, she come down by the 3.40 and two gentlemen with her, an American gent and a young army chap, neither of them with valets. His lordship come down with a foreign gentleman, the one that's been shot, as likely as not, by the 5.40 and the foreign gentleman's valet, Mr. Eversley come by the same train. Mrs. Revel came by the 7.25, and another foreign-looking gentleman came by it too, one with a bald head and a hook nose. Mrs. Revel's maid came by the 8.56. Johnson paused, 
out of breath. And there was no one for the cricketers? Johnson shook his head. He must have come by car then, said the inspector. Johnson, make a note to institute inquiries at the cricketers on your way back. We want to know all about any strangers. He was very sunburned, that gentleman. Likely as not, he's come from foreign parts too. The inspector nodded his head with great sagacity, as though to imply that that was the sort of wide-awake man he was, not to be caught napping under any consideration. The car passed in through the park gates of chimneys. Descriptions of that historic place can be found in any guidebook. It is also number three in historic homes of England, price 21S. On Thursdays, Charza Banks come over from Middlingham and view those portions of it which are open to the public. In view of all of these facilities to describe chimneys would be superfluous. They were received at the door by a white-headed butler whose demeanour was perfect. We are not accustomed, it seemed to say, to having murder committed within these walls. But these are evil days. Let us meet disaster with perfect calm and pretend with our dying breath that nothing out of the usual has occurred. His lordship, said the butler, is expecting you. This way, if you please. He led them to a small cosy room which was Lord Catterham's refuge from the magnificence elsewhere and announced them. The police, my lord, and Dr. Cartwright. Lord Catterham was pacing up and down in a visibly agitated state. Ha! Inspector, you've turned up at last. I'm thankful for that. How are you, Cartwright? This is the very devil of a business, you know. The very devil of a business. And Lord Catterham, running his hands through his hair in a frenzied fashion until it stood upright in little tufts, looked even less like a peer of the realm than usual. Where's the body? asked the doctor, in curt, business-like fashion. Lord Catterham turned to him as though relieved at being asked a direct question. In the council chamber, just where it was found, I wouldn't have it touched. I believed, er, uh, that that was the correct thing to do. Quite right, my lord, said the inspector approvingly. He produced a notebook and pencil. And who discovered the body? Did you? Good Lord, no, said Lord Catterham. You don't think I usually get up at this unearthly hour in the morning, do you? No, a housemaid found it. She screamed a good deal, I believe. I didn't hear her myself. Then they came to me about it, and of course I got up and came down. And there it was, you know. You recognise the body as that of one of your guests? That's right, Inspector. By name. This perfectly simple question seemed to upset Lord Catterham. He opened his mouth once or twice and then shut it again. Finally, he asked feebly, Do you mean, do you mean, what was his name? Yes, my lord. Well, said Lord Catterham, looking slowly round the room as though hoping to gain inspiration. His name was, I should say it was, yes, decidedly so, Count Stanislaus. There was something so odd about Lord Catterham's manner that the inspector ceased using his pencil and stared at him instead. But at that moment, a diversion occurred which seemed highly welcome to the embarrassed peer. The door opened and a girl came into the room. She was tall, slim and dark, with an attractive boyish face and a very determined manner. This was Lady Eileen Brent, commonly known as Bundle. Lord Catterham's eldest daughter. She nodded to the others and addressed her father directly. I've got him, she announced. For a moment, the inspector was on the point of starting forward under the impression that the young lady had captured the murderer red-handed. But almost immediately, he realised that her meaning was quite different. Lord Catterham uttered a sigh of relief. That's a good job. What did he say? He's coming over at once. We are to use the utmost discretion. Her father made a sound of annoyance. That's just the sort of idiotic thing George Lomax would say. However, once he comes, I shall wash my hands of the whole affair. 
he appeared to cheer up a little at the prospect. And the name of the murdered man was Count Stanislaus, queried the doctor. A lightning glance passed between father and daughter, and then the former said with some dignity, Certainly, I said so just now. I asked because you didn't seem quite sure about it before, explained Cartwright. There was a faint twinkle in his eye, and Lord Catterham looked at him reproachfully. I'll take you to the council chamber, he said more briskly. They followed him, the inspector bringing up the rear and darting sharp glances all around him as he went, much as though he expected to find a clue in a picture frame or behind a door. Lord Catterham took a key from his pocket and unlocked a door, flinging it open. They all passed into a big room panelled in oak with three long windows giving on the terrace. There was a long refectory table and a good many oak chests and some beautiful old chairs. On the walls were various paintings of dead and gone Catterhams and others. Near the left-hand wall, about halfway between the door and the window, a man was lying on his back, his arms flung wide. Dr. Cartwright went over and knelt down by the body. The inspector strode across to the windows and examined them in turn. The centre one was closed, but not fastened. On the steps outside were footprints leading up to the window and a second set going away again. Clear enough, said the inspector, with a nod, but there ought to be footprints on the inside as well. They'd show up plain on this parquet floor. I think I can explain that, interposed Bundle. The housemaid had polished half the floor this morning before she saw the body. You see, it was dark when she came in here. She went straight across to the windows, drew the curtains, and began on the floor, and naturally didn't see the body which is hidden from that side of the room, by the table. She didn't see it until she came right on top of it. The inspector nodded. Well, said Lord Catterham, eager to escape, I'll leave you here, inspector. You'll be able to find me if you, er, uh, want me but Mr. George Lomax is coming over from Wyvern Abbey shortly, and he'll be able to tell you far more than I could. It's his business, really. I can't explain, but he will when he comes. Lord Catterham beat a precipitate retreat without waiting for a reply. Too bad for Lomax, he complained, letting me in for this. What's the matter, Treadwell? The white-haired butler was hovering deferentially at his elbow. I have taken the liberty, my lord, of advancing the breakfast hour as far as you are concerned. Everything is ready in the dining room. I don't suppose for a minute I can eat anything, said Lord Catram gloomily, turning his footsteps in that direction. Not for a moment. Bundle slipped her hand through his arm, and they entered the dining room together. On the sideboard were half a score of heavy silver dishes ingeniously kept hot by patent arrangements. Omelette, said Lord Catterham, lifting each lid in turn. Eggs and bacon, kidneys, deviled bird, haddock, cold ham, cold pheasant. I don't like any of these things, Treadwell. Ask the cook to poach me an egg, will you? Very good, my lord. Treadwell withdrew. Lord Catterham, in an absent-minded fashion, helped himself plentifully to kidneys and bacon poured himself out a cup of coffee and sat down at the long table. Bundle was already busy with a plate full of eggs and bacon. I'm damned hungry, said Bundle with her mouth full. It must be the excitement. It's all very well for you, complained her father. You young people like excitement, but I'm in a very delicate state of health. Avoid all worry, that's what Sir Abner Willis said. Avoid all worry. So easy for a man sitting in his consulting room in Harley Street to say that. How can I avoid worry when that ass Lomax lands me with a thing like this? I ought to have been firm at the time. I ought to have put my foot down. With a sad shake of the head, Lord Catterham rose and carved himself a plate of ham. Codders has certainly done it this time, observed Bundle cheerfully. He was almost incoherent over the telephone. He'll be here in a minute or two, spluttering nineteen to the dozen about discretion and hushing it up. Lord Catterham groaned at the prospect. Was he up? he asked. 
He told me, replied Bundle, that he had been up and dictating letters and memoranda ever since seven o'clock. Proud of it, too, remarked her father. Extraordinarily selfish, these public men. They make their wretched secretaries get up at the most unearthly hours in order to dictate rubbish to them. If a law was passed compelling them to stop in bed until eleven, what a benefit it would be to the nation. I wouldn't mind so much if they didn't talk such balderdash. Lomax is always talking to me of my position. As if I had any. Who wants to be a peer nowadays? Nobody, said Bundle. They'd much rather keep a prosperous public house. Treadwell reappeared silently with two poached eggs in a little silver dish, which he placed on the table in front of Lord Catterham. What's that, Treadwell? said the latter, looking at them with faint distaste. Poached eggs, my lord. I hate poached eggs, said Lord Catterham peevishly. They're so insipid. I don't like to look at them even. Take them away, will you, Treadwell? Very good, my lord. Treadwell and the poached eggs withdrew as silently as they came. Thank God no one gets up early in this house, remarked Lord Catterham devoutly. We shall have to break this to them when they do, I suppose. He sighed. I wonder who murdered him, said Bundle. And why? That's not our business, thank goodness, said Lord Catterham. That's for the police to find out. Not that Badgeworthy will ever find out anything. On the whole, I rather hope it was Nosistein. Meaning, the all-British syndicate. Why should Mr. Isaacstein murder him when he'd come down here on purpose to meet him? High finance, said Lord Catterham vaguely. And that reminds me, I shouldn't be at all surprised if Isaac Stein wasn't an early riser. He may blow in upon us at any minute. It's a habit in the city. I believe that however rich you are, you always catch the 9.17. The sound of a motor being driven at great speed was heard through the open window. Codders, cried Bundle. Father and daughter leaned out of the window and hailed the occupant of the car as it drew up before the entrance. In here, my dear fellow, in here, cried Lord Catterham, hastily swallowing his mouthful of ham. George had no intention of climbing in through the window. He disappeared through the front door and reappeared ushered in by Treadwell, who withdrew at once. Have some breakfast, said Lord Catterham. Shaking him by the hand, what about a kidney? George waved the kidney aside impatiently. This is a terrible calamity, terrible, terrible. It is indeed. Some haddock? No, no, it must be hushed up. At all costs, it must be hushed up. As Bundle had prophesied, George began to splutter. I understand your feelings, said Lord Catterham sympathetically. Try an egg and bacon or some haddock. A totally unforeseen contingency, national calamity, concessions jeopardised. Take time, said Lord Catterham, and take some food. What you need is some food to pull you together. Poached eggs now. There were some poached eggs here a minute or two ago. I don't want any food, said George. I've had breakfast, and even if I hadn't had any, I shouldn't want it. We must think what is to be done. You have told no one, as yet. Well, there's Bundle and myself, and the local police, and Cartwright, and all the servants, of course. George groaned. Pull yourself together, my dear fellow said Lord Catterham kindly. I wish you'd have some breakfast. You don't seem to realise that you can't hush up a dead body. It's got to be buried and all that sort of thing. Very unfortunate, but there it is. George became suddenly calm. You are right, Catterham. You have called in the local police, you say. That will not do. We must have battle. Battle, murder and sudden death inquired Lord Catterham, with a puzzled face. No, no, you misunderstand me. I referred to Superintendent Battle of Scotland Yard, a man of the utmost discretion. He worked with us in that deplorable business of the party funds. What was that? asked Lord Catterham, with some interest. 
but George's eye had fallen upon Bundle as she sat half in and half out of the window, and he remembered discretion just in time. He rose. We must waste no time. I must send off some wires at once. If you write them out, Bundle will send them through the telephone. George pulled out a fountain pen and began to write with incredible rapidity. He handed the first one to Bundle, who read it with a great deal of interest. God, what a name, she remarked. Baron how much? Baron Lollapretchel. Bundle blinked. I've got it, but it will take some conveying to the post office. George continued to write. Then he handed his labours to Bundle and addressed the master of the house. The best thing that you can do, Catterham. Yes, said Lord Catterham apprehensively, is to leave everything in my hands. Certainly, said Lord Catterham, with alacrity. Just what I was thinking myself. You'll find the police and Dr Cartwright in the council chamber. With the, er, uh, with the body, you know. My dear Lomax, I place chimneys, unreservedly, at your disposal. Do anything you like. Thank you, said George. If I should want to consult you. But Lord Catterham had faded unobtrusively through the farther door. Bundle had observed his retreat with a grim smile. I'll send off those telegrams at once, she said. You know your way to the council chamber. Thank you, Lady Eileen. George hurried from the room. Chapter 11. Superintendent Battle Arrives So apprehensive was Lord Catterham of being consulted by George that he spent the whole morning making a tour of his estate. Only the pangs of hunger drew him homeward. He also reflected that by now, the worst would surely be over. He sneaked into the house quietly by a small side door. From there, he slipped neatly into his sanctum. He flattered himself that his entrance had not been observed, but there he was mistaken. The watchful Treadwell let nothing escape him. He presented himself at the door. You'll excuse me, my lord. What is it, Treadwell? Mr. Lomax, my lord, is anxious to see you in the library as soon as you return. By this delicate method, Treadwell conveyed that Lord Catterham had not yet returned unless he chose to say so. Lord Catterham sighed and then rose. I suppose it will have to be done sooner or later. In the library, you say? Yes, my lord. Sighing again, Lord Catterham crossed the wide spaces of his ancestral home and reached the library door. The door was locked. As he rattled the handle, it was unlocked from inside, opened a little way, and the face of George Lomax appeared, peering out suspiciously. His face changed when he saw who it was. Ah, Catterham, come in. We were just wondering what had become of you. Murmuring something vague about duties on the estate, repairs for tenants, Lord Catterham sidled in apologetically. There were two other men in the room. One was Colonel Melrose, the chief constable. The other was a squarely built, middle-aged man with a face so singularly devoid of expression as to be quite remarkable. Superintendent Battle arrived half an hour ago, explained George. He has been round with Inspector Badgeworthy and seen Dr Cartwright. He now wants a few facts from us. They all sat down after Lord Catterham had greeted Melrose and acknowledged his introduction to Superintendent Battle. I need hardly tell you, Battle, said George, that this is a case in which we must use the utmost discretion. The superintendent nodded in an offhand manner that rather took Lord Catterham's fancy. That will be all right, Mr Lomax, but no concealments from us. I understand that the dead gentleman was called Count Stanislaus. At least, that that is the name by which the household knew him. Now, was that his real name? It was not. What was his real name? Prince Michael of Herzoslovakia. Battle's eyes opened just a trifle, otherwise he gave no sign. And what, if I may ask the question, was the purpose of his visit here? Just pleasure? There was a further object, Battle. All this in the strictest confidence, of course. Yes, 
Yes, Mr. Lomax. Colonel Melrose. Of course. Well, then, Prince Michael was here for the express purpose of meeting Mr. Herman Isaacstein. A loan was to be arranged on certain terms. Which were? I do not know the exact details. Indeed, they had not yet been arranged. But in the event of coming to the throne, Prince Michael pledged himself to grant certain oil concessions to those companies in which Mr. Isaacstein is interested. The British government was prepared to support the claim of Prince Michael to the throne in view of his pronounced British sympathies. Well, said Superintendent Battle, I don't suppose I need go further into it than that. Prince Michael wanted the money, Mr. Isaacstein wanted oil, and the British government was ready to do the heavy fathers. Just one question. Was anyone else after those concessions? I believe an American group of financiers had made overtures to His Highness and been turned down, eh? But George refused to be drawn. Prince Michael's sympathies were entirely pro-British, he repeated. Superintendent Battle did not press the point. Lord Catterham, I understand that this is what occurred yesterday. You met Prince Michael in town and journeyed down here in company with him. The prince was accompanied by his valet, a Herzoslovakian named Boris Anchukov, but his equerry, Captain Andrashi, remained in town. The prince on arriving declared himself greatly fatigued and retired to the apartments set aside for him. Dinner was served to him there, and he did not meet the other members of the house party. Is that correct? Quite correct. This morning, a housemaid discovered the body at approximately 7.45 a.m. Dr. Cartwright examined the dead man and found that death was the result of a bullet fired from a revolver. No revolver was found, and no one in the house seems to have heard the shot. On the other hand, the dead man's wristwatch was smashed by the fall and marks the crime as having been committed at exactly a quarter to twelve. Now what time did you retire to bed last night? We went early. Somehow or other, the party didn't seem to go, if you know what I mean, superintendent. We went up about half past ten, I should say. Thank you. Now I will ask you, Lord Catterham, to give me a description of all the people staying in the house. But excuse me, I thought the fellow who did it came from outside. Superintendent Battle smiled. I dare say he did. I dare say he did. But all the same, I've got to know who was in the house. Matter of routine, you know. Well, there was Prince Michael and his valet, and Mr. Herman Isaacstein. You know all about them. Then there was Mr. Eversley. Who works in my department? put in George condescendingly. And who was acquainted with the real reason of Prince Michael's being here? No, I should not say that, replied George weightily. Doubtless he realised that something was in the wind, but I did not think it necessary to take him fully into my confidence. I see. Will you go on, Lord Catterham? Let me see. There was Mr Hiram Fish. Who is Mr Hiram Fish? Mr. Fish is an American. He brought over a letter of introduction from Mr. Lucius Gott. You've heard of Lucius Gott? Superintendent Battle smiled acknowledgement. Who had not heard of Lucius C. Gott, the multimillionaire? He was specially anxious to see my first editions. Mr. Gott's collection is, of course, unequalled, but I've got several treasures myself. This Mr. Fish was an enthusiast. Mr. Lomax had suggested that I ask one or two extra people down here this weekend to make things seem more natural, so I took the opportunity of asking Mr. Fish. That finishes the men. As for the ladies, there is only Mrs. Revel, and I expect she brought a maid or something like that. Then there was my daughter, and of course the children and their nurses and governesses and all the servants. Lord Catterham paused and took a breath. Thank you, said the detective. A mere matter of routine, but necessary as such. There is no doubt, I suppose, asked George ponderously, that the murderer entered by the window. Battle paused for a minute before replying slowly. 
There were footsteps leading up to the window and footsteps leading away from it. A car stopped outside the park at 11.40 last night. At 12 o'clock, a young man arrived at the Jolly Cricketers in a car and engaged a room. He put his boots outside to be cleaned. They were very wet and muddy, as though he had been walking through the long grass in the park. George leant forward eagerly. Could not the boots be compared with the footprints? They were. Well, they exactly correspond. That settles it, cried George. We have the murderer. The young man, what is his name, by the way? At the inn, he gave the name of Anthony Cade. This Anthony Cade must be pursued at once and arrested. You won't need to pursue him, said Superintendent Battle. Why? Because he's still there. What? Curious, isn't it? Colonel Melrose eyed him keenly. What's in your mind, Battle? Out with it. I just say it's curious, that's all. Here's a young man who ought to cut and run, but he doesn't cut and run. He stays here and gives us every facility for comparing footmarks. What do you think, then? I don't know what to think, and that's a very disturbing state of mind. Do you imagine, began Colonel Melrose, but broke off as a discreet knock came at the door. George rose and went to it. Treadwell inwardly suffering from having to knock at doors in this low fashion, stood dignified upon the threshold and addressed his master. Excuse me, my lord, but a gentleman wishes to see you on urgent and important business, connected, I understand, with this morning's tragedy. What's his name? asked Battle suddenly. His name, sir, is Mr. Anthony Cade, but he said it wouldn't convey anything to anybody. It seemed to convey something to the four men present. They all sat up in varying degrees of astonishment. Lord Catherham began to chuckle. I'm really beginning to enjoy myself. Show him in, Treadwell. Show him in at once. Chapter 12. Anthony tells his story. Mr. Anthony Cade, announced Treadwell. Enter suspicious stranger from Village Inn, said Anthony. He made his way toward Lord Catterham with a kind of instinct rare in strangers. At the same time, he summed up the other three men in his own mind thus. One, Scotland Yard. Two, local dignitary, probably chief constable. Three, harassed gentleman on the verge of apoplexy, possibly connected with the government. I must apologise, continued Anthony, still addressing Lord Catterham for forcing my way in like this, I mean. But it was rumoured round the Jolly Dog, or whatever the name of your local pub may be, that you had had a murder up here. And as I thought I might be able to throw some light upon it, I came along. For a moment or two, no one spoke. Superintendent Battle, because he was a man of ripe experience who knew how infinitely better it was to let everyone else speak if they could be persuaded upon to do so. Colonel Melrose because he was habitually taciturn, George because he was in the habit of having notice given him of the question, Lord Catterham because he had not the least idea of what to say. The silence of the other three, however, and the fact that he had been directly addressed, finally forced speech upon the last named. Uh, quite so, quite so, he said nervously. Won't you sit down? Thank you, said Anthony. George cleared his throat portentously. Uh, when you say you can throw light upon this matter, you mean... I mean, said Anthony, that I was trespassing upon Lord Catterham's property, for which I hope he will forgive me, last night, at about 11.45, and that I actually heard the shot fired. I can at any rate fix the time of the crime for you. He looked round at the three in turn his eyes resting longest on Superintendent Battle, the impassivity of whose face he seemed to appreciate. But I hardly think that that's news to you, he added gently. Meaning by that, Mr. Cade, asked Battle. Just this. I put on shoes when I got up this morning. Later, when I asked for my boots, I couldn't have them. Some nice young constable had called round for them. 
so I naturally put two and two together and hurried up here to clear my character if possible. A very sensible move, said Battle non-committally. Anthony's eyes twinkled a little. I appreciate your reticence, Inspector. It is Inspector, isn't it? Lord Catterham interposed. He was beginning to take a fancy to Anthony. Superintendent Battle of Scotland Yard, this is Colonel Melrose, our Chief Constable, and Mr Lomax. Anthony looked sharply at George. Mr George Lomax? Yes. I think, Mr Lomax, said Anthony, that I had the pleasure of receiving a letter from you yesterday. George stared at him. I think not, he said coldly. But he wished that Miss Oscar were here. Miss Oscar wrote all his letters for him and remembered who they were to and what they were about. A great man like George could not possibly remember all these annoying details. I think, Mr Cade, he hinted, that you were about to give us some, er, uh, explanation of what you were doing in the grounds last night at 11.45. His tone said plainly, and whatever it may be, we are not likely to believe it. Yes, Mr Cade, what were you doing, said Lord Catterham, with lively interest. Well, said Anthony regretfully, I'm afraid it's rather a long story. He drew out his cigarette case. May I? Lord Catterham nodded, and Anthony lit a cigarette and braced himself for the ordeal. He was aware none better of the peril in which he stood. In the short space of 24 hours, he had become embroiled in two separate crimes. His actions in connection with the first would not bear looking into for a second. After deliberately disposing of one body and so defeating the aims of justice, he had arrived upon the scene of the second crime at the exact moment when it was being committed. For a young man looking for trouble, he could hardly have done better. South America, thought Anthony to himself, simply isn't in it with this. He had already decided upon his course of action. He was going to tell the truth with one trifling alteration and one grave suppression. The story begins, said Anthony, about three weeks ago in Bulawayo. Mr Lomax, of course, knows where that is, outpost of the empire. What do we know of England who only England know? All that sort of thing. I was conversing with a friend of mine, a Mr James McGrath, he brought out the name slowly, with a thoughtful eye on George. George bounded in his seat and repressed an exclamation with difficulty. The upshot of our conversation was that I came to England to carry out a little commission for Mr McGrath, who was unable to go himself. Since the passage was booked in his name, I travelled as James McGrath. I don't know what particular kind of offence that was, the superintendent can tell me, I dare say and run me in for so many months hard, if necessary. We'll get on with the story, if you please, sir, said Battle, but his eyes twinkled a little. On arrival in London, I went to the Blitz Hotel, still as James McGrath. My business in London was to deliver a certain manuscript to a firm of publishers, but almost immediately, I received deputations from the representatives of two political parties of a foreign kingdom. The methods of one were strictly constitutional, the methods of the other were not. I dealt with them both accordingly, but my troubles were not over. That night, my room was broken into, and an attempt at burglary was made by one of the waiters at the hotel. That was not reported to the police, I think, said Superintendent Battle. You are right, it was not. Nothing was taken, you see but I did report the occurrence to the manager of the hotel and he will confirm my story and tell you that the waiter in question decamped rather abruptly in the middle of the night. The next day, the publishers rang me up and suggested that one of their representatives would call upon me and receive the manuscript. I agreed to this and the arrangement was duly carried out on the following morning. Since I have heard nothing further, I presume the manuscript reached them safely. Yesterday, still as James McGrath, I received a letter from Mr Lomax. Anthony paused. He was by now beginning to enjoy himself. George shifted uneasily. I remember, he murmured. 
such a large correspondence, the name of course being different, I could not be expected to know. And I may say, George's voice rose a little, firm in the assurance of moral stability, that I consider this, this, masquerading as another man in the highest degree improper. I have no doubt, no doubt whatever, that you have incurred a severe legal penalty. In this letter, continued Antony, unmoved, Mr Lomax made various suggestions concerning the manuscript in my charge. He also extended an invitation to me from Lord Catterham to join the house party here. Delighted to see you, my dear fellow, said that nobleman. Better late than never, eh? George frowned at him. Superintendent Battle bent an unmoved eye upon Antony. No, and is that your explanation of your presence here last night, sir? He asked. Certainly not, said Antony warmly. When I am asked to stay at a country house, I don't scale the wall late at night, tramp across the park, and try the downstairs windows. I drive up to the front door, ring the bell, and wipe my feet on the mat. I will proceed. I replied to Mr Lomax's letter, explaining that the manuscript had passed out of my keeping and therefore regretfully declining Lord Catterham's kind invitation. But after I had done so, I remembered something which had up till then escaped my memory. He paused. The moment had come for skating over thin ice. I must tell you that in my struggle with the waiter Giuseppe, I had wrested from him a small bit of paper with some words scribbled on it. They had conveyed nothing to me at the time, but I still had them, and the mention of chimneys recalled them to me. I got the torn scrap out and looked at it. It was as I had thought. Here is the piece of paper, gentlemen, you can see for yourselves. The words on it are chimneys 11.45 Thursday. Battle examined the paper attentively. Of course, continued Anthony, the word chimneys might have nothing whatever to do with this house. On the other hand, it might. And undoubtedly, this Giuseppe was a thieving rascal. I made up my mind to motor down here last night, satisfy myself that all was as it should be, put up at the inn and call upon Lord Catterham in the morning and put him on his guard in case some mischief should be intended during the weekend. Quite so, said Lord Catterham encouragingly. Quite so. I was late in getting here, had not allowed enough time. Consequently, I stopped the car climbed over the wall and ran across the park. When I arrived on the terrace, the whole house was dark and silent. I was just turning away when I heard a shot. I fancied that it came from inside the house, and I ran back, crossed the terrace and tried the windows. But they were fastened, and there was no sound of any kind from inside the house. I waited a while, but the whole place was still as the grave so I made up my mind that I had made a mistake and that what I had heard was a stray poacher. Quite a natural conclusion to come to under the circumstances, I think. Quite natural, said Superintendent Battle, expressionlessly. I went on to the inn, put up as I said, and heard the news this morning. I realised, of course, that I was a suspicious character, bound to be under the circumstances, and came up here to tell my story hoping it wasn't going to be handcuffs for one. There was a pause. Colonel Melrose looked sideways at Superintendent Battle. I think the story seems clear enough, he remarked. Yes, said Battle. I don't think we'll be handing out any handcuffs this morning. Any questions, Battle? There's one thing I'd like to know. What was this manuscript? He looked across at George and the latter replied with a trace of unwillingness. The memoirs of the late Count Stilptich. You see? You needn't say anything more, said Battle. I see perfectly. He turned to Anthony. Do you know who it was that was shot, Mr. Cade? At the Jolly Dog, it was understood to be a Count Stanislaus or some such name. Tell him, said Battle laconically to George Lomax. George was clearly reluctant but he was forced to speak. The gentleman who was staying here incognito as Count Stanislaus was His Highness Prince Michael of Herzoslovakia. Anthony whistled. That must be deuced awkward, he remarked. Superintendent Battle, 
who had been watching Anthony closely, gave a short grunt as though satisfied of something and rose abruptly to his feet. There are one or two questions I'd like to ask Mr. Cade, he announced. I'll take him into the council chamber with me if I may. Certainly, certainly, said Lord Catterham. Take him anywhere you like. Anthony and the detective went out together. The body had been removed from the scene of the tragedy. There was a dark stain on the floor where it had lain, but otherwise there was nothing to suggest that a tragedy had ever occurred. The sun poured in through the three windows, flooding the room with light and bringing out the mellow tone of the old panelling. Anthony looked around him with approval. Very nice, he commented. Nothing much to beat old England, is there? Did it seem to you at first it was in this room the shot was fired? asked the superintendent, not replying to Anthony's eulogium. Let me see. Anthony opened the window and went out on the terrace, looking up at the house. Yes, that's the room all right, he said. It's built out and occupies all the corner. If the shot had been fired anywhere else, it would have sounded from the left, but this was from behind me or to the right, if anything. That's why I thought of poachers. It's at the extremity of the wing, you see. He stepped back across the threshold and asked suddenly, as though the idea had just struck him. But why do you ask? You know he was shot here, don't you? Ah, said the superintendent. We never know as much as we'd like to know. But yes, he was shot here all right. Now you said something about trying the windows, didn't you? Yes. They were fastened from the inside. How many of them did you try? All three of them. Sure of that, sir? I'm in the habit of being sure. Why do you ask? That's a funny thing, said the superintendent. What's a funny thing? When the crime was discovered this morning, the middle one was open. Not latched, that is to say. Whoa, said Anthony, sinking down on the window seat and taking out his cigarette case. That's rather a blow. That opens up quite a different aspect of the case. It leaves us two alternatives. Either he was killed by someone in the house, and that someone unlatched the window after I had gone to make it look like an outside job, incidentally with me as Little Willie, or else, not to mince matters, I'm lying. I dare say you incline to the second possibility, but, upon my honour, you're wrong. Nobody's going to leave this house until I'm through with them, I can tell you that, said Superintendent Battle grimly. Anthony looked at him keenly. How long have you had the idea that it might be an inside job? He asked. Battle smiled. I've had a notion that way all along. Your trail was a bit too flaring, if I may put it that way. As soon as your boots fitted the footmarks, I began to have my doubts. I congratulate Scotland Yard, said Anthony lightly. But at that moment, the moment when Battle apparently admitted Anthony's complete absence of complicity in the crime, Anthony felt more than ever the need of being upon his guard. Superintendent Battle was a very astute officer. It would not do to make any slip with Superintendent Battle about. That's where it happened, I suppose, said Anthony, nodding towards the dark patch upon the floor. Yes. What was he shot with? A revolver? Yes, but we shan't know what make until they get the bullet out at the autopsy. It wasn't found then? No, it wasn't found. No clues of any kind? Well, we've got this. Rather after the manner of a conjurer, Superintendent Battle produced a half sheet of notepaper, and as he did so, he again watched Anthony closely without seeming to do so. But Anthony recognised the design upon it without any sign of consternation. Aha! Comrades of the Red Hand again. If they're going to scatter this sort of thing about, they ought to have it lithographed. It must be a frightful nuisance doing every one separately. Where was this found? Underneath the body. You've seen it before, sir. Anthony recounted to him in detail his short encounter with that public-spirited association. The idea is, I suppose, that the comrades did him in. Do you think it likely, sir? Well, 
it would be in keeping with their propaganda, but I've always found that those who talk most about blood have never actually seen it run. I shouldn't have said the comrades had the guts myself. And they're such picturesque people, too. I don't see one of them disguising himself as a suitable guest for a country house. Still, one never knows. Quite right, Mr. Cade. One never knows. Anthony looked suddenly amused. I see the big idea now. Open window, trail of footprints. Suspicious stranger at Village Inn. But I can assure you, my dear superintendent, that whatever I am, I am not the local agent of the Red Hand. Superintendent Battle smiled a little. Then he played his last card. Would you have any objection to seeing the body? He shot out suddenly. None whatever, rejoined Anthony. Battle took a key from his pocket and preceding Anthony down the corridor, paused at a door and unlocked it. It was one of the smaller drawing rooms. The body lay on a table covered with a sheet. Superintendent Battle waited until Anthony was beside him and then whisked away the sheet suddenly. An eager light sprang into his eyes at the half-uttered exclamation and the start of surprise which the other gave. So you do recognise him, Mr. Cade, he said in a voice that he strove to render devoid of triumph. I've seen him before, yes, said Anthony, recovering himself, but not as Prince Michael Obolovich. He purported to come from Messrs. Balderson and Hodgkins, and he called himself Mr. Holmes. Chapter 13 The American Visitor Superintendent Battle replaced the sheet with the slightly crestfallen air of a man whose best point has fallen flat. Anthony stood with his hands in his pockets lost in thought. So that's what old Lollipop meant when he talked about other means, he murmured at last. I beg your pardon, Mr. Cade. Nothing, Superintendent. Forgive my abstraction. You see, I, or rather my friend Jimmy McGrath, has been very neatly done out of a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds is a nice sum of money, said Battle. It isn't the thousand pounds so much, said Anthony, though I agree with you that it's a nice sum of money. It's being done that maddens me. I handed over that manuscript like a little woolly lamb. It hurts, Superintendent. Indeed it hurts. The detective said nothing. Well, well, said Anthony. Regrets are vain, and all may not yet be lost. I've only got to get hold of dear old Stilptitch's reminiscences between now and next Wednesday, and all will be gas and gaiters. Would you mind coming back to the council chamber, Mr. Cade? There's one little thing I want to point out to you. Back in the council chamber, the detective strode over at once to the middle window. I've been thinking, Mr. Cade. This particular window is very stiff, very stiff indeed. You might have been mistaken in thinking that it was fastened. It might just have stuck. I'm sure, yes, I'm almost sure that you were mistaken. Anthony eyed him keenly. And supposing I say that I'm quite sure I was not. Don't you think you could have been, said Battle, looking at him very steadily. Well, to oblige you, Superintendent, yes. Battle smiled in a satisfied fashion. You're quick in the uptake, sir, and you'll have no objection to saying so careless-like at a suitable moment. None whatever. I... He paused as Battle gripped his arm. The superintendent was bent forward, listening. Enjoining silence on Anthony with a gesture, he tiptoed noiselessly to the door and flung it suddenly open. On the threshold stood a tall man with black hair neatly parted in the middle, china blue eyes with a particularly innocent expression and a large placid face. Your pardon, gentlemen, he said in a slow, drawling voice with a pronounced transatlantic accent but is it permitted to inspect the scene of the crime? I take it that you are both gentlemen from Scotland Yard? I have not that honour, said Anthony, but this gentleman is Superintendent Battle of Scotland Yard. Is that so, said the American gentleman, with a great appearance of interest. Pleased to meet you, sir. My name is Hiram P. Fish, of New York City. What was it you wanted to see, Mr. Fish? asked the detective. 
The American walked gently into the room and looked with much interest at the dark patch on the floor. I am interested in crime, Mr. Battle. It is one of my hobbies. I have contributed a monograph to one of our weekly periodicals on the subject degeneracy and the criminal. As he spoke, his eyes went gently round the room, seeming to note everything in it. They rested just a shade longer on the window. The body, said Superintendent Battle, stating a self-evident fact, has been removed. Surely, said Mr Fish. His eyes went on to the panelled walls. Some remarkable pictures in this room, gentlemen. A Holbein, two Van Dykes, and, if I am not mistaken, a Velasquez. I am interested in pictures, and likewise in first editions. It was to see his first editions that Lord Catterham was so kind as to invite me down here. He sighed gently. I guess that's all off now. It would show a proper feeling, I suppose, for the guests to return to town immediately. I'm afraid that can't be done, sir, said Superintendent Battle. Nobody must leave the house until after the inquest. Is that so? And when is the inquest? Maybe tomorrow, may not be until Monday. We've got to arrange for the autopsy and see the coroner. I get you, said Mr Fish. Under the circumstances, though, it will be a melancholy party. Battle led the way to the door. We'd best get out of here, he said. We're keeping it locked still. He waited for the other two to pass through and then turned the key and removed it. I opine, said Mr. Fish, that you are seeking for fingerprints. Maybe, said the superintendent laconically. I should say to that, on a night such as last night, an intruder would have left footprints on the hardwood floor. None inside, plenty outside. Mine, explained Anthony cheerfully. The innocent eyes of Mr. Fish swept over him. Young man, he said, you surprise me. They turned a corner and came out into the big, wide hall, panelled like the council chamber in Old Oak, and with a wide gallery above it. Two other figures came into sight at the far end. Aha, said Mr. Fish, our genial host. This was such a ludicrous description of Lord Catterham that Antony had to turn his head away to conceal a smile. And with him, continued the American, is a lady whose name I did not catch last night. But she is bright. She is very bright. With Lord Catterham was Virginia Revel. Anthony had been anticipating this meeting all along. He had no idea how to act. He must leave it to Virginia. Although he had full confidence in her presence of mind, he had not the slightest idea what line she would take. He was not long left in doubt. Why, it's Mr. Cade, said Virginia. She held out both hands to him. So you found you could come down after all? My dear Mrs. Revel, I had no idea Mr. Cade was a friend of yours, said Lord Catterham. He's a very old friend, said Virginia, smiling at Antony with a mischievous glint in her eye. I ran across him in London unexpectedly yesterday and told him I was coming down here. Antony was quick to give her her pointer. I explained to Mrs. Revel, he said, that I had been forced to refuse your kind invitation, since it had really been extended to quite a different man, and I couldn't very well foist a perfect stranger on you under false pretenses. Well, well, my dear fellow, said Lord Catterham, that's all over and done with now. I'll send down to the cricketers for your bag. It's very kind of you, Lord Catterham, but... Nonsense, of course you must come to chimneys. Horrible place, the cricketers. To stay in, I mean. Of course you must come, Mr. Cade, said Virginia softly. Antony realised the altered tone of his surroundings. Already Virginia had done much for him. He was no longer an ambiguous stranger. Her position was so assured and unassailable that anyone for whom she vouched was accepted as a matter of course. He thought of the pistol in the tree at Burnham Beaches and smiled inwardly. I'll send for your traps, said Lord Catterham to Antony. I suppose in the circumstances we can't have any shooting? A pity, but there it is. And I don't know what the devil to do with Isaacstein. 
It's all very unfortunate. The depressed peer sighed heavily. That's settled then, said Virginia. You can begin to be useful right away, Mr. Cade, and take me out on the lake. It's very peaceful there, and far from crime and all that sort of thing. Isn't it awful for poor Lord Catterham having a murder done in his house? But it's George's fault, really. This is George's party, you know. Ah, said Lord Catterham, but I should never have listened to him. He assumed the air of a strong man betrayed by a single weakness. One can't help listening to George, said Virginia. He always holds you so that you can't get away. I'm thinking of patenting a detachable lapel. I wish you would, chuckled her host. I'm glad you're coming to us, Cade. I need support. I appreciate your kindness very much, Lord Catterham, said Antony. Especially, he added, when I'm such a suspicious character. But my staying here makes it easier for battle. In what way, sir? asked the superintendent. It won't be so difficult to keep an eye on me, explained Antony gently. And by the momentary flicker of the superintendent's eyelids, he knew that his shot had gone home. Chapter 14. Mainly Political and Financial Except for that involuntary twitch of the eyelids, Superintendent Battle's impassivity was unimpaired. If he had been surprised at Virginia's recognition of Antony, he did not show it. He and Lord Catterham stood together and watched those two go out through the garden door. Mr Fish also watched them. Nice young fellow, that, said Lord Catterham. Very nice for Mrs Revel to meet an old friend, murmured the American. They have been acquainted some time, presumably. Seems so, said Lord Catterham. But I've never heard her mention him before. Oh, by the way, Battle, Mr Lomax has been asking for you. He's in the blue morning room. Very good, Lord Catterham. I'll go there at once. Battle found his way to the blue morning room without difficulty. He was already familiar with the geography of the house. Ah, oh, there you are, Battle, said Lomax. He was striding impatiently up and down the carpet. There was one other person in the room, a big man sitting in a chair by the fireplace. He was dressed in very correct English shooting clothes, which nevertheless sat strangely upon him. He had a fat yellow face and black eyes, as impenetrable as those of a cobra. There was a generous curve to the big nose and power in the square lines of the vast jaw. Come in, Battle, said Lomax irritably, and shut the door behind you. This is Mr. Herman Isaacstein. Battle inclined his head respectfully. He knew all about Mr. Herman Isaacstein, and though the great financier sat there silent, Whilst Lomax strode up and down and talked, he knew who was the real power in the room. We can speak more freely now, said Lomax. Before Lord Catterham and Colonel Melrose, I was anxious not to say too much. You understand, Battle, these things mustn't get about. Ah, said Battle, but they always do, more's the pity. Just for a second, he saw a trace of a smile on the fat yellow face. It disappeared as suddenly as it had come. Now what do you really think of this young fellow, this Anthony Cade, continued George? Do you still assume him to be innocent? Battle shrugged his shoulders very slightly. He tells a straight story. Part of it we shall be able to verify. On the face of it, it accounts for his presence here last night. I shall cable to South Africa, of course, for information about his antecedents. Then you regard him as cleared of all complicity? Battle raised a large square hand. Not so fast, sir. I never said that. What is your own idea about the crime, Superintendent Battle? Asked Isaacstein, speaking for the first time. His voice was deep and rich and had a certain compelling quality about it. It had stood him in good stead at board meetings in his younger days. It's rather too soon to have ideas, Mr. Isaacstein. I've not got beyond asking myself the first question. What is that? Oh, it's always the same. Motive. 
Who benefits by the death of Prince Michael? We've got to answer that before we can get anywhere. The Revolutionary Party of Herzoslovakia, began George. Superintendent Battle waved him aside with something less than his usual respect. It wasn't the comrades of the Red Hand, sir, if you're thinking of them. But the paper, with the scarlet hand on it, put there to suggest the obvious solution. George's dignity was a little ruffled. Really, Battle, I don't see how you can be so sure of that. Bless you, Mr Lomax, we know all about the comrades of the Red Hand. We've had our eye on them ever since Prince Michael landed in England. That sort of thing is the elementary work of the department. They'd never be allowed to get within a mile of him. I agree with Superintendent Battle, said Isaacstein. We must look elsewhere. You see, sir, said Battle, encouraged by his support. We do know a little about the case. If we don't know who gains by his death, we do know who loses by it. Meaning, said Isaacstein. His black eyes were bent upon the detective. More than ever, he reminded Battle of a hooded cobra. You and Mr Lomax, not to mention the Loyalist Party of Herzoslovakia. If you'll pardon the expression, sir, you're in the soup. Really, Battle, interposed George, shocked to the core. Go on, Battle, said Isaacstein. In the soup describes the situation very accurately. You're an intelligent man. You've got to have a king. You've lost your king like that, he snapped his large fingers. You've got to find another in a hurry, and that's not an easy job. No, I don't want to know the details of your scheme. The bare outline is enough for me. But, I take it, it's a big deal? Isaac Stein bent his head slowly. It's a very big deal. That brings me to my second question. Who is the next heir to the throne of Herzoslovakia? Isaac Stein looked across at Lomax. The latter answered the question with a certain reluctance and a good deal of hesitation. That would be, I should say yes, in all probability, Prince Nicholas would be the next heir. Ah, said Battle. And who is Prince Nicholas? A first cousin of Prince Michael's. Ah, said Battle. I should like to hear all about Prince Nicholas especially where he is at present. Nothing much is known of him, said Lomax. As a young man, he was most peculiar in his ideas, consorted with socialists and republicans, and acted in a way highly unbecoming to his position. He was sent down from Oxford, I believe, for some wild escapade. There was a rumour of his death two years later in the Congo, but it was only a rumour. He turned up a few months ago when news of the royalist reaction got about. Indeed, said Battle. Where did he turn up? In America. America. Battle turned to Isaac Stein with one laconic word. Oil? The financier nodded. He represented that if the Herzoslovakians chose a king, they would prefer him to Prince Michael as being more in sympathy with modern enlightened ideas, and he drew attention to his early democratic views and his sympathy with Republican ideals. In return for financial support, he was prepared to grant concessions to a certain group of American financiers. Superintendent Battle so far forgot his habitual impassivity as to give vent to a prolonged whistle. So that is it, he muttered. In the meantime, the Loyalist Party supported Prince Michael, and you felt sure you'd come out on top. And then this happens. You surely don't think, began George. It was a big deal, said Battle. Mr. Isaac Stein says so, and I should say that what he calls a big deal is a big deal. There are always unscrupulous tools to be got hold of, said Isaac Stein quietly. For the moment, Wall Street wins. But they've not done with me yet. Find out who killed Prince Michael, Superintendent Battle if you want to do your country a service. One thing strikes me as highly suspicious, put in George. Why did the equerry, Captain Andrashi, not come down with the prince yesterday? I've inquired into that, said Battle. It's perfectly simple. He stayed in town to make arrangements with a certain lady, on behalf of Prince Michael, 
for next weekend. The Baron rather frowned on such things, thinking them injudicious at the present stage of affairs, so His Highness had to go about them in a whole and corner manner. He was, if I may say so, inclined to be a rather a uh, dissipated young man. I'm afraid so, said George ponderously. Yes, I'm afraid so. There's one other point we ought to take into account, I think, said Battle, speaking with a certain amount of hesitation. King Victor's supposed to be in England. King Victor? Lomax frowned in an effort at recollection. Notorious French crook, sir. We've had a warning from the Surete in Paris. Of course, said George. I remember now. Jewel thief, isn't he? Why, that's the man. He broke off abruptly. Isaac Stein, who had been frowning abstractedly at the fireplace, looked up just too late to catch the warning glance telegraphed from the superintendent battle to the other. But being a man sensitive to vibrations in the atmosphere, he was conscious of a sense of strain. You don't want me any longer, do you, Lomax? he inquired. No, thank you, my dear fellow. Would it upset your plans if I returned to London, Superintendent Battle? I'm afraid so, sir, said the superintendent civilly. You see, if you go, there will be others who'll want to go also, and that would never do. Quite so. The great financier left the room, closing the door behind him. Splendid fellow, Isaac Stein, murmured George Lomax perfunctorily. Very powerful personality, agreed Superintendent Battle. George began to pace up and down again. What you say disturbs me greatly, he began. King Victor, I thought he was in prison. Came out a few months ago. French police meant to keep on his heels, but he managed to give them the slip straight away. He would too. One of the coolest customers that ever lived. For some reason or other, they believe he's in England and have notified us to that effect. But what should he be doing in England? That's for you to say, sir, said Battle significantly. You mean, you think, you know the story, of course. Ah, yes, I can see you do. I was not in office, of course, at the time, but I heard the whole story from the late Lord Catterham. An unparalleled catastrophe. The koh -nor, said Battle reflectively. Hush, Battle. George glanced suspiciously round him. I beg of you, mention no names. Much better not. If you must speak of it, call it the K. The superintendent looked wooden again. You don't connect King Victor with this crime, do you, Battle? It's just a possibility, that's all. If you'll cast your mind back, sir, you'll remember that there were four places where a, a certain royal visitor might have concealed the jewel. Chimneys was one of them. King Victor was arrested in Paris three days after the disappearance, if I may call it that, of the K. It was always hoped that he would someday lead us to the jewel. But Chimneys has been ransacked and overhauled a dozen times. Yes, said Battle sapiently but it's never much good looking when you don't know where to look. Only suppose now that this King Victor came here to look for the thing, was surprised by Prince Michael and shot him. It's possible, said George, a most likely solution of the crime. I wouldn't go as far as that. It's possible, but not much more. Why is that? Because King Victor has never been known to take a life, said Battle seriously. Oh, but a man like that, a dangerous criminal. But Battle shook his head in a dissatisfied manner. Criminals always act true to type, Mr Lomax. It's surprising. All the same? Yes. I'd rather like to question the prince's servant. I've left him purposely to the last. We'll have him in here, sir, if you don't mind. George signified his assent. The superintendent rang the bell. Treadwell answered it and departed with his instructions. He returned shortly accompanied by a tall, fair man with high cheekbones and very deep-set blue eyes and an impassivity of countenance which almost rivaled battles. Boris Anshukov? Yes. You were valet to Prince Michael? I was His Highness's valet, yes. 
The man spoke good English, though with a markedly harsh foreign accent. You know that your master was murdered last night. A deep snarl, like the snarl of a wild beast, was the man's only answer. It alarmed George, who withdrew prudently towards the window. When did you see your master last? His Highness retired to bed at half past ten. I slept, as always, in the ante room next to him. He must have gone down to the room downstairs by the other door, the door that gave on to the corridor. I did not hear him go. It may be that I was drugged. I have been an unfaithful servant. I slept while my master woke. I am accursed. George gazed at him, fascinated. You loved your master, eh? said Battle, watching the man closely. Boris's features contracted painfully. He swallowed twice. Then his voice came, harsh with emotion. I say this to you, English policeman. I would have died for him. And since he is dead, and I still live, my eyes shall not know sleep, or my heart rest, until I have avenged him. Like a dog will I nose out his murderer, and when I have discovered him, ah! His eyes lit up. Suddenly, he drew an immense knife from beneath his coat and brandished it aloft. Not all at once will I kill him. Oh no, first I will slit his nose and cut off his ears and put out his eyes, and then, then, into his black heart, I will thrust this knife. Swiftly he replaced the knife and, turning, left the room. George Lomax, his eyes always protuberant, but now goggling almost out of his head, stared at the closed door. Purebred hurts a Slovakian, of course, he muttered. Most uncivilised people, a race of brigands. Superintendent Battle rose alertly to his feet. Either that man's sincere, he remarked, or he's the best bluffer I've ever seen. And, if it's the former, God help Prince Michael's murderer when that human bloodhound gets hold of him. Chapter 15. The French Stranger Virginia and Anthony walked side by side down the path which led to the lake. For some minutes after leaving the house, they were silent. It was Virginia who broke the silence at last with a little laugh. Oh dear, she said, isn't it dreadful? Here I am so bursting with the things I want to tell you and the things I want to know that I simply don't know where to begin. First of all, she lowered her voice, what have you done with the body? How awful it sounds, doesn't it? I never dreamt that I should be so steeped in crime. I suppose it's quite a novel sensation for you, agreed Antony, but not for you. Well, I've never disposed of a corpse before, certainly. Tell me about it. Briefly and succinctly, Antony ran over the steps he had taken on the previous night. Virginia listened attentively. I think you were very clever, she said approvingly when he had finished. I can pick up the trunk again when I go back to Paddington. The only difficulty that might arise is if you had to give an account of where you were yesterday evening. I can't see that that can arise. The body can't have been found until late last night, or possibly this morning. Otherwise, there would have been something about it in this morning's papers. And whatever you may imagine from reading detective stories, doctors aren't such magicians that they can tell you exactly how many hours a man has been dead. The exact time of his death will be pretty vague. An alibi for last night would be far more to the point. I know. Lord Catherine was telling me all about it. But the Scotland Yard man is quite convinced of your innocence now, isn't he? Anthony did not reply at once. He doesn't look particularly astute, continued Virginia. I don't know about that, said Anthony slowly. I have an impression that there are no flies on Superintendent Battle. He appears to be convinced of my innocence, but I'm not so sure. He's stumped at present by my apparent lack of motive. Apparent, cried Virginia. But what possible reason could you have for murdering an unknown foreign count? Antony darted a sharp glance at her. You were at one time or other in Herzoslovakia, weren't you? he asked. Yes, I was there with my husband for two years at the embassy. 
that was just before the assassination of the king and queen. Did you ever run across Prince Michael Obolovich? Michael? Of course I did, horrid little wretch. He suggested, I remember, that I should marry him morganatically. Did he really? And what did he suggest you should do about your existing husband? Oh, he had a sort of David and Uriah scheme all made out. And how did you respond to this amiable offer? Well, said Virginia, unfortunately one had to be diplomatic. So poor little Michael didn't get it as straight from the shoulder as he might have done, but he retired hurt all the same. Why all this interest about Michael? Something I'm getting at in my own blundering fashion. I take it that you didn't meet the murdered man? No. To put it like a book, he retired to his own apartments immediately on arrival. And of course you haven't seen the body. Virginia, eyeing him with a good deal of interest, shook her head. Could you get to see it, do you think? By means of influence in high places, meaning Lord Catterham. I dare say I could. Why? Is it an order? Good Lord, no, said Antony, horrified. Have I been as dictatorial as all that? No, it's simply this. Count Stanislaus was the incognito of Prince Michael of Herzog, Slovakia. Virginia's eyes opened very wide. I see. Suddenly her face broke into its fascinating one-sided smile. I hope you don't suggest that Michael went to his room simply to avoid seeing me. Something of the kind, admitted Antony. You see, if I'm right in my idea that someone wanted to prevent your coming to chimneys, the reason seems to lie in your knowing Herzog, Slovakia. Do you realise that you're the only person here who knew Prince Michael by sight? Do you mean that this man who was murdered was an imposter? Asked Virginia abruptly. That is the possibility that crossed my mind. If you can get Lord Catterham to show you the body, we can clear up that point at once. He was shot at 11.45, said Virginia thoughtfully. The time mentioned on that scrap of paper. The whole thing's horribly mysterious. That reminds me, is that your window up there, the second from the end over the council chamber? No, my room is in the Elizabethan wing, the other side. Why? Simply because as I walked away last night, after thinking I heard a shot, the light went up in that room. How curious. I don't know who has that room, but I can find out by asking Bundle. Perhaps they heard the shot. If so, they haven't come forward to say so. I understood from battle that nobody in the house heard the shot fired. It's the only clue of any kind that I've got, and I dare say it's a pretty rotten one, but I mean to follow it up for what it's worth. It's curious, certainly, said Virginia thoughtfully. They had arrived at the boathouse by the lake and had been leaning against it as they talked. And now for the whole story, said Antony. We'll paddle gently about on the lake, secure from the prying ears of Scotland Yard, American visitors, and curious housemaids. I've heard something from Lord Catterham, said Virginia, but not nearly enough. To begin with, which are you really, Anthony Cade or Jimmy McGrath? For the second time that morning, Anthony unfolded the history of the last six weeks of his life, with this difference that the account given to Virginia needed no editing. He finished up with his own astonished recognition of Mr. Holmes. By the way, Mrs. Revel, he ended, I've never thanked you for imperiling your immortal soul by saying that I was an old friend of yours. Of course you're an old friend, cried Virginia. You don't suppose I'd cumber you with a corpse and then pretend you were a mere acquaintance next time I met you? No, indeed, she paused. Do you know one thing that strikes me about all this, she went on? that there's some extra mystery about those memoirs that we haven't fathomed yet. I think you're right, agreed Antony. There's one thing I'd like you to tell me, he continued. What's that? Why did you seem so surprised when I mentioned the name of Jimmy McGrath to you yesterday at Pont Street? Had you heard it before? I had. Sherlock Holmes, George, my cousin, George Lomax, you know, came to see me the other day and suggested a lot of frightfully silly things. His idea was that I should come down here and make myself agreeable to this man, McGrath, and Delilah the memoirs out of him somehow. 
He didn't put it like that, of course. He talked a lot of nonsense about English gentlewomen and things like that. But his real meaning was never obscure for a moment. It was just the sort of rotten thing poor old George would think of. And then I wanted to know too much, and he tried to put me off with lies that wouldn't have deceived a child of two. Well, his plan seems to have succeeded, anyhow, observed Anthony. Here am I, the James McGrath he had in mind, and here are you being agreeable to me. But alas for poor old George, no memoirs. Now I've got a question for you. When I said I hadn't written those letters, you said you knew I hadn't. You couldn't know any such thing. Oh, yes, I could, said Anthony, smiling. I've got a good working knowledge of psychology. You mean your belief in the sterling worth of my moral character was such that... But Anthony was shaking his head vigorously. Not at all. I don't know anything about your moral character. You might have a lover, and you might write to him. But you'd never lie down to be blackmailed. The Virginia revel of those letters was scared stiff. You'd have fought. I wonder who the real Virginia revel is. Where she is, I mean. It makes me feel as though I had a double somewhere. Anthony lit a cigarette. You know that one of the letters was written from chimneys, he asked at last. What? Virginia was clearly startled. When was it written? It wasn't dated. But it's odd, isn't it? I'm perfectly certain no other Virginia Revel has ever stayed at chimneys. Bundle or Lord Catterham would have said something about the coincidence of the name if she had. Yes, it's rather queer. Do you know, Mrs. Revel, I am beginning to disbelieve profoundly in this other Virginia Revel. She's very elusive, agreed Virginia. Extraordinarily elusive. I am beginning to think that the person who wrote those letters deliberately used your name. But why? cried Virginia. Why should they do such a thing? Oh, that's just the question. There's the devil of a lot to find out about everything. Who do you really think killed Michael? asked Virginia suddenly. The comrades of the Red Hand. I suppose they might have done so, said Anthony in a dissatisfied voice. Pointless killing would be rather characteristic of them. Let's get to work, said Virginia. I see Lord Catterham and Bundle strolling together. The first thing to do is to find out definitely whether the dead man is Michael or not. Anthony paddled to shore and a few moments later they had joined Lord Catterham and his daughter. Lunch is late, said his lordship in a depressed voice. Battle has insulted the cook, I expect. This is a friend of mine, Bundle, said Virginia. Be nice to him. Bundle looked earnestly at Anthony for some minutes and then addressed a remark to Virginia as though he had not been there. Where do you pick up these nice-looking men, Virginia? How do you do it? says she enviously. You can have him, said Virginia generously. I want Lord Catterham. She smiled upon the flattered peer, slipped her hand through his arm, and they moved off together. Do you talk? asked Bundle. Or are you just strong and silent? Talk, said Anthony. I babble, I murmur, I gurgle. Like the running brook, you know. Sometimes I even ask questions. As for instance, who occupies the second room on the left from the end? He pointed to it as he spoke. What an extraordinary question, said Bundle. You intrigue me greatly. Let me see. Yes, that's Mademoiselle Brune's room. The French governess. She endeavours to keep my young sisters in order. Dulcie and Daisy, like the song, you know. I dare say they'd have called the next one. Dorothy May. But mother got tired of having nothing but girls and died. Thought someone else could take on the job of providing an heir. Mademoiselle Brun, said Anthony thoughtfully. How long has she been with you? Two months. She came to us when we were in Scotland. Ha, said Anthony. I smell a rat. I wish I could smell some lunch, said Bundle. Do I ask the Scotland Yard man to have lunch with us, Mr. Cade? You're a man of the world, you know about the etiquette of such things. We've never had a murder in the house before. Exciting, isn't it? I'm sorry your character was so completely cleared this morning. 
I've always wanted to meet a murderer and see for myself if they're as genial and charming as the Sunday papers always say they are. God, what's that? What? Seemed to be a taxi approaching the house. Its two occupants were a tall man with a bald head and a black beard, and a smaller and younger man with a black moustache. Anthony recognised the former and guessed that it was he, rather than the vehicle which contained him, that had wrung the exclamation of astonishment from his companion's lips. Unless I much mistake, he remarked, that is my old friend, Baron Lollipop. Baron what? I call him Lollipop for convenience. The pronouncing of his own name tends to harden the arteries. It nearly wrecked the telephone this morning, remarked Bundle. So that's the Baron, is it? I foresee he'll be turned on to me this afternoon, and I've had Isaac Stein all the morning. Let George do his own dirty work, say I, and to hell with politics. Excuse me leaving you, Mr Cade, but I must stand by poor old father. Bundle retreated rapidly to the house. Anthony stood looking after her for a minute or two and thoughtfully lighted a cigarette. As he did so, his ear was caught by a stealthy sound quite near him. He was standing by the boathouse, and the sound seemed to come from just round the corner. The mental picture conveyed to him was that of a man vainly trying to stifle a sudden sneeze. Now I wonder, I very much wonder who's behind the boathouse, said Anthony to himself. We'd better see, I think. Suiting the action to the word, he threw away the match he had just blown out and ran lightly and noiselessly round the corner of the boathouse. He came upon a man who had evidently been kneeling on the ground and was just struggling to rise to his feet. He was tall, wore a light-coloured overcoat and glasses, and, for the rest, had a short, pointed black beard and a slightly foppish manner. He was between 30 and 40 years of age, and altogether of a most respectable appearance. What are you doing here? asked Antony. He was pretty certain that the man was not one of Lord Catterham's guests. I ask your pardon, said the stranger with a marked foreign accent and what was meant to be an engaging smile. It is that I wish to return to the jolly crickets, and I have lost my way. Would monsieur be so good as to direct me? Certainly, said Antony, but you don't go there by water, you know. Eh? said the stranger with the air of one at a loss. I said, repeated Antony with a meaning glance at the boathouse, that you won't get there by water. There's a right of way across the park, some distance away, but all this is the private part. You're trespassing. I am most sorry, said the stranger. I lost my direction entirely. I thought I would come up here and inquire. Antony refrained from pointing out that kneeling behind a boathouse was a somewhat peculiar manner of prosecuting inquiries. He took the stranger kindly by the arm. You go this way, he said. Right round the lake and straight on, you can't miss the path. When you get on it, turn to the left and it will lead you to the village. You're staying at the cricketers, I suppose. I am, monsieur, since this morning. Many thanks for your kindness in directing me. Don't mention it, said Antony. I hope you haven't caught cold. Eh? said the stranger. From kneeling on the damp ground, I mean, explained Antony. I fancied I heard you sneezing. I may have sneezed, admitted the other. Quite so, said Anthony. But you shouldn't suppress a sneeze, you know. One of the most eminent doctors said so only the other day. It's frightfully dangerous. I don't remember exactly what it does to you, whether it's an inhibition or whether it hardens your arteries, but you must never do it. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, monsieur, for setting me on the right road. Second suspicious stranger from Village Inn, murmured Antony to himself as he watched the other's retreating form and one that I can't quite place, either. Appearance that of a French commercial traveller. I don't quite see him as a comrade of the Red Hand. Does he represent yet a third party in the harassed state of Herzoslovakia? The French governess has the second window from the end. A mysterious Frenchman is found slinking round the grounds, listening to conversations that are not meant for his ears. 
I'll bet my hat there's something in it. Musing thus, Anthony retraced his steps to the house. On the terrace, he encountered Lord Catterham, looking suitably depressed, and two new arrivals. He brightened a little at the sight of Anthony. Ah, oh, there you are, he remarked. Let me introduce you to Baron. Er, uh, er, uh, and Captain Andrashi, Mr. Anthony Cade. The Baron stared at Anthony with growing suspicion. Mr. Cade, he said stiffly. I think not. A word alone with you, Baron, said Anthony. I can explain everything. The Baron bowed and the two men walked down the terrace together. Baron, said Anthony, I must throw myself upon your mercy. I have so far strained the honour of an English gentleman as to travel to this country under an assumed name. I represented myself to you as Mr. James McGrath but you must see for yourself that the deception involved was infinitesimal. You are doubtless acquainted with the works of Shakespeare and his remarks about the unimportance of the nomenclature of roses. This case is the same. The man you wanted to see was the man in possession of the memoirs. I was that man. As you know only too well, I am no longer in possession of them. A neat trick. Baron, a very neat trick. Who thought of it? You or your principal? His Highness's own idea it was. And for anyone but him to carry it out, he would not permit. He did it jolly well, said Anthony with approval. I never took him for anything but an Englishman. The education of an English gentleman did the prince receive, explained the baron. The custom of Herzoslovakia, it is. No professional could have pinched those papers better said Anthony. May I ask, without indiscretion, what has become of them? Between gentlemen, began the Baron. You are too kind, Baron, murmured Anthony. I've never been called a gentleman so often as I have in the last 48 hours. I to you say this. I believe them to be burnt. You believe, but you don't know, eh? Is that it? His Highness in his own keeping retained them. His purpose, it was to read them, and then by the fire, to destroy them. I see, said Anthony. All the same, they are not the kind of light literature you'd skim through in half an hour. Among the effects of my martyred master, they have not discovered been. It is clear, therefore, that burnt they are. Hmm, said Anthony. I wonder. He was silent for a minute or two and then went on. I have asked you these questions, Baron, because, as you may have heard, I myself have been implicated in the crime. I must clear myself absolutely, so that no suspicion attaches to me. Undoubtedly, said the Baron, your honour demands it. Exactly, said Anthony. You put these things so well. I haven't got the knack of it. To continue, I can only clear myself by discovering the real murderer. And to do that, I must have all the facts. This question of the memoirs is very important. It seems to me possible that to gain possession of them might be the motive of the crime. Tell me, Baron, is that a very far-fetched idea? The Baron hesitated for a moment or two. You yourself the memoirs have read? He asked cautiously at length. I think I am answered, said Antony, smiling. Now, Baron, there's just one thing more. I should like to give you fair warning that it is still my intention to deliver that manuscript to the publishers on Wednesday next, the 13th of October. The Baron stared at him. But you have no longer got it. On Wednesday next, I said. Today is Friday. That gives me five days to get hold of it again. But if it is burnt... I don't think it is burnt. I have good reasons for not believing so. As he spoke, they turned the corner of the terrace. A massive figure was advancing towards them. Anthony, who had not yet seen the great Mr. Herman Isaacstein, looked at him with considerable interest. Ah, Baron, said Isaacstein, waving the big black cigar he was smoking. This is a bad business, a very bad business. My good friend, Mr. Isaacstein, it is indeed, cried the Baron. 
all our noble edifice in ruins is... Anthony tactfully left the two gentlemen to their lamentations and retraced his steps along the terrace. Suddenly, he came to a halt. A thin spiral of smoke was rising into the air, apparently from the very centre of the yew hedge. It must be hollow in the middle, reflected Anthony. I've heard of such things before. He looked swiftly to right and left of him. Lord Catterham was at the farther end of the terrace with Captain Andrushy. Their backs were towards him. Anthony bent down and wriggled his way through the massive yew. He had been quite right in his supposition. The yew hedge was really not one, but two. A narrow passage divided them. The entrance to this was about halfway up, on the side of the house. There was no mystery about it, but no one seeing the yew hedge from the front would have guessed at the probability. Anthony looked down the narrow vista. About halfway down, a man was reclining in a basket chair. A half-smoked cigar rested on the arm of the chair, and the gentleman himself appeared to be asleep. Hmm, said Anthony to himself. Evidently, Mr. Hiram Fish prefers sitting in the shade.